Cheers, queers. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Beautiful. The Big Gay Energy team is back with a super fun interview today. Our intro uh, and our interviewee today is Gypsy Taylor from Our Flag Means Death. Thank you so much for being here. Gypsy is the brilliant costume designer that was behind that show. And we are so, so, so excited to talk to you. Welcome, Gypsy. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to be on the Big Gate Energy Podcast. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we begin, were, did you work on both seasons or just season two? Just season two. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Because the, the filming moved from la to new zealand correct it did yeah. it did yeah yeah and during the first season i was unavailable on another project and then the designer who did the first season she was unavailable for the second season because she was off doing uh loki in london oh, oh wow yeah, very cool very cool that she's a brilliant designer yeah so the timing worked out that i was able to jump on board and and funnily enough, I was living in LA, so I had to relocate to Auckland oh, to do no. it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is fine by me. <laughs> I love I love working in New Zealand. The last time I worked in New Zealand was about 18 years ago on the Chronicles oh, of Canada. Wow. Yeah. I want to go to New Zealand so bad. <laughs> oh, I just want to travel. <laughs> so pretty, and it's the best people. It's just beautiful. Must go. Okay, well, we asked Twitter, um, I guess we should say X, but I, I hate that. I refuse. <laughs> if they had any questions for you, and boy, did Ooh. they have them. <laughs> they yeah, asked they? so That's many so questions, much. in fact, that we decided to just let them take over the entire interview. I'm okay So with that. here is what the audience is dying to know about the costumes. Okay. So our first question comes from a fan who has been designing their own concept costumes for the characters in season three. Amazing. Unfortunately, Amazing. We're getting a season three, but you know what? This is helping it live on. Yes, correct. So at indigo underscore underscore key asks, did the actor's personalities, interests, et cetera, inform your design process? I started designing a long time before I met the actors, like probably seven or eight weeks before I even met them. And I knew the actors work. So I was already very familiar with Rhys Darby and Taika Waititi and, and that New Zealand crew. So I already knew their personalities from, you know, what I've seen of their work over the years. And it wasn't until the actors were in the room with me that then we put a few little twists on things. So essentially... Uh, I took what had already been established in season one and then read all the new scripts for season two and kind of did my little design tweaks and thought what I thought would look good and pretty much had it all designed. And then the actors arrived just a few, uh, you know, a couple of weeks before we shot. So little things changed when they were in the room, you know, like different little character things that they thought, oh, I might like to keep this scarf or I might like to, you know, hang on to a few little items but otherwise it was all done by the time they arrived very nice yeah i had a lot of creative freedom and i had a fantastic director david jenkins who obviously lives and breathes our flag means death so uh you know everything that i came up with any concept any drawing any design i'd run past him and he had he had all the characters in his in his wonderful brain so we were able to do that together I don't question. believe um, someone asked this in here, but I'm curious, what is it like going into a show that already is established rather than starting the show yourself? Uh, it's a little bit intimidating because the designer of season one did such a beautiful job and and brought these characters to life. And so upon arrival, I, I was like, I don't know what more I can bring. These are amazing, you know, but then there was a whole new wild story and a whole new lot of uh, new characters. And so I was able to put my stamp on it, but also pay homage to the beautiful work of season one. And it was a wonderful fabulous. <laughs> no, Seriously, thank you. It. <laughs> thank you. We had a lot of, we had a lot more girls in this season, which was really exciting to do a lot more femme yes. for Mm. Yes. which also the boys were really excited about. Like when, when they all arrived, they were like, oh, thank God, there's some women. <laughs> <fire."> <laughs> That's really refreshing to hear. And like, 
it really made everything so much more fun because then you get like the different culture you know that was coming in with like the Chinese kind of like yeah. pirates and so it was really fun in a lot of different ways to see like a melding of people and yeah. costumes yeah yeah so oh so fun to design like so fun all right so the next question we have from you is from at everyone get cake which <laughs> love, love that or orange cake you know? They don't specify. <laughs> Hold on. Let us know if you're listening at everyone get cake. What kind of cake? But is, is this cake or is the cake by the ocean thing? I think it's like <laughs> samba. Samba is the cake. You know, roach. Roach with his orange cake. Could be like a little nod to Yes, that. the 40 oranges. Correct. See, I immediately right. thought of Ari Antoinette. So oh. definitely purple with that one. Everyone gets cake. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. What's the wonderful question? All right. So Roach's Cake is asking, for Gypsy, you've cited Prince, at Adam, Ant, and Iggy Pop as influences for Our Flag Means Death Season 2. Absolutely. I would love to hear more details about how these and other musical icons inspired specific costumes on the show. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I, I mean, music always inspires me. Uh, whenever I go into any kind of job, uh, right now I'm working at a job that's set in 1989, so I've been like delving deep into like the billboard charts of 89 and so uh, as a designer I will always go to music first music and art and anything pop culture around that period um and our show you know was 18th century which is very classic but then David Jenkins said to me he goes you know think of it like these characters are just walking down the streets of New York in the 80s and that's one of my favorite periods because you're thinking about like Patti Smith and Warhol and Keith Haring and Robert Maplethorpe and all these genius artists of that period were like bubbling away creating incredible art including all the musicians and so straight up I like started a playlist of my own and and you know heavy on Blondie and Hart and all these just great artists of the time and that was really inspiring me just with the sounds and and of course, each of those artists came with their unique style. And you think about someone like Prince and Sheila E, and they uh, were just so original and and unique and queer and all the good things. And so I straight up went to them and went, uh, you know, what? How did you know Prince had these like pants that sort of like instead of a straight fly, just had this diagonal fly with with buttons. And even as simple as that, I incorporated that into. Archie's leather pants and instead of buttons we put big screws through and uh yeah so just like little bits like that and Adam and the Ants is like very new romantic lots of like they I mean they were honing it on the pirate style in the 80s because of Vivian Westwood and so they'd already like taken that inspiration from the 18th century pirates but made it 80s and flamboyant and so you know, there was just so much good visual and and uh, musical reference to bounce off of, really, and just add into our show to make it feel like all the characters were walking down the streets of New York. So you could just see them and go, oh, hey, what's up? Good leather pants. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that now that you're saying that. <laughs> yeah, it does fit. <laughs> it's funny that you do mention Vivian Westwood um, because I immediately clocked your earrings <laughs> I, I, that's, I there's um there's this like necklace lighter that I want to get so bad and it's of that symbol baby yeah. but it's yeah. oh God, she's I'd have to save up to get a piece by her but like that's definitely the dream <laughs> yeah, yeah she's one of my heroes I mean she was such a unique designer and put her own stamp on on a time period and a she invented punk so she was just the yeah, coolest definitely a classic staple Oh, yeah. So I admire her so much. I have a couple of little pieces. They're expensive, but I save up over Worth time. So we're going to get that little tiny piece of beautiful things. <laughs> I'm glad you noticed. I put them on for you guys today. <laughs> I dressed up a little bit. Um, speaking of impressive work, uh, we have a question from Emily Loves Kale. What is something you've worked on for the show that was technically difficult or impressive, but, but something viewers may not realize because it wasn't on screen for that long or for some other reason? Um, just because we love to see any cool details that we may have missed. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, straight up, I thought of The Mermaid, but then you all saw saw that on screen because technically that was that was 
difficult and wonderful to come to life. Oh, don't uh, worry. We have multiple questions about that later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so much curiosity. Okay, good. It was impressive. Okay, good. I, uh, things like Zheng's army, like uh, it, it seemed so simple, but we made every single outfit for her entire crew. And they were these beautiful hand dyed linen uh, tops and pants. And the pants, with it had this incredible cut that my um my tailor Anna Deacon uh, invented, which was sort of this crossover pant that tied, so you didn't need any buttons or zips or anything current. It could have just been they were just very simple but so beautiful. And then we had to make about three hundred of them uh, because we <laughs> had so many of Zheng's crew in, and you never knew their size because you'd get extras on the day. So we'd had to have like extra small to extra large. In, and, and they all had to be broken down. We also individually made all their shoes because those little, those sort of little tiny slippers are really difficult to get. They look very modern. They kind of look like a little van slip on. So I went back to some 18th century reference of how they were made. And they were just two pieces of black cotton with this kind of woven base. And we made 300 pairs of shoes. Like, when does that ever happen? Like, normally. So wild. Yeah, wild. <laughs> Oh. Yeah. How long did that take? Like I for, mean, for uh, designing Jing's crew in general, like uh, outfits and shoes. It's hard to put a time limit on anything that gets made because we get a certain amount of pre-production. So you're doing all the things at once. So you're chipping away like by little bit by little bit to get everything done in time for the schedule. So Jing's crew came up a little bit later in the schedule. So we were able to just chip away at it a long, long time. But, you know, like in the dye room, everybody was – turning blue and <laughs> and it had all this like really delicious piping and all this lining and uh yeah just it was uh a lot of work and I think you see it on screen because it feels like there's a lot of her crew working for her another one that yeah. didn't, didn't make it on screen which was very sweet was we hand knitted uh we John Sock and Aww. yeah you never saw them but they were so beautiful they had uh I, I have this wonderful friend who's just the most incredible knitter in New Zealand her name is Sarah Shepherd and she hand knitted uh little socks with skull and crossbones on them <laughs> that is so darling so beautiful but you never saw them on screen sadly do you have a photo of it I do yeah I'll have to I'll find it and I'll upload it I'm sure Thank everyone you. would be so excited to see it so beautiful. And we, John, you know, Christian is just the most beautiful man. And he, in like, he's, he's huge. Like we, we had to hand make shoes for him too, because he has a very large foot. And so when the socks came out, they were like these little Christmas stockings almost. Because they were, <laughs> they were so large. And then they fitted him perfectly and he loved them. Yeah. So I've got did a beautiful he, did he end up, uh Did he end up keeping the socks after uh, season two wrapped up? I can't remember. I can't remember where they went. Usually we wrap everything up and put it into storage and let the yeah. producers keep everything should there be another season. So, yeah, I'm not sure where they ended up. <laughs> I'll put them online and maybe some knitter will come forward and, and knit a pair to match. <laughs> Sounds like a challenge, everybody listening at home. <laughs> I've seen how good and clever you makers are. <laughs> I'm curious. Um yeah. I know you've been talking a little bit about like actually making things are the costumes mostly like handmade from your designs or are they like gathered from other things you find that are already made? Uh, all the principals. So any of my main cast and my day players, people like Ricky and, uh, and the likes of, you know, other characters, they are all handmade from scratch head to toe like all the jewelry all the belts uh, and we gather pieces so I we gathered a whole lot of belt buckles that were old and uh, but then often in film like we need multiples for things so if we found some really old weird piece of chunky metal we would cast it and make a few of them you know so that we had multiples but yeah everything was made even you know I was talking about those screws in Archie's pants they were they had to be soft so we we sculpted them as well we couldn't use real screws because otherwise she wouldn't be able to do all of her high kicking and 
that sort yeah. of thing. And Vico's fish hook belt was sculpted. And Very nice. Yeah. So everything, everything you see or uh, screen printed and, uh, you know, inventing fabrics along the way to make it uh, unique and original. So I would draw the sketch and then I would detail it and say, you know, I sort of wanted this colour and this texture and and then I had a workshop of just wonderful creatives and makers and, yeah, we made it all. Anybody in the background was sort of like pieced together from from stock that we found and but we would punkify it, you know, we would rip it and burn it and <laughs> do all the fun things. It sounds but... like what the crew on the Revenge would do, rip it. Right. <laughs> yeah. We like, yeah, like... this will look cool. Yeah. We made like fake vomit that we put on things so that like like rum vomit and then we had like fake bird poo from seagulls and anything that made it look like they were like living in a at sea. We had this kind of like salt rim texture that we would spray paint on everything so it looked like this you know that salt had eaten away at their mm-hmm. clothes. Yeah. That's really. such a great detail. Yeah. It is. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I you just keep saying things that I have questions about. Uh, how, what did you make the vomit and the bird poop out of? <laughs> Honestly, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it involved a lot of paint and sort of like Mod Podge gesso stuff that you'd colour. So it all had to uh, be hard and in place but still look wet. So you can add things with like a little bit of resin or a little bit of – there's like art materials basically so that they're safe yeah. for the actors and that we can also throw it in a washing machine if we need to but then it stays oh. yeah black pete always has had like one really big glob of seagull on his shoulder that a seagull had shat on him <laughs> <laughs> he would <Always. laughs> i definitely did have a quick follow-up question since when you were talking about like uh like burning clothing adding vomit oh. stuff like that um I, that did raise the question of, um, did you design uh, Steed's cursed uh, suit that they find on the uh, the mercenary ship, yeah. I believe I want to say? Yeah, I did. Um, oh, that is so impressive. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was such, it was such a look. Like that, like, that was like, like, I, like, I, it just it fit it fit him so well. It was so like like complimentary. Like I can see yeah. why he was very apprehensive to give it up when the crew was like, "It's cursed. It's cursed." <laughs> it, oh, he had to look very handsome in it, which is not hard with Reese. I I found it very easy to make him look super handsome, and he just had to own it, you know. And the minute he put it on, and it had those big matador shoulders and these kind of like dandy Oscar Wilde tails and. And, you know, that it was velvet and all these delicious things. And I gave him all these jewels, like all the buttons, they were encrusted with jewels. And, yeah, I mean, he, like, danced around the room. And, and I, I've, I've, said, I've said before, like, we make everything first out of a calico, uh, which also is known as a toile. And so you just make it all out of calico so you make sure that it fits before you cut into the beautiful fabric and make the final costume. And so even in the calico, which is just cream, he was spinning around the room and like started doing the tail flick and and like his shoulders went back and he like his bum got a bit tighter and all this like amazing actory things came out in just the the calico which was rare and wonderful (laughs) very very lovely that's how you know it's right (laughs) that's right that's right (laughs) you're like we've got a winner (laughs) This isn't about the costume in particular, but if that's cursed, how is the shirt under it not cursed? Yeah, we also had that follow-up question because we were so confused on the I mean, that's part. not really a sure. question for you, yeah. but just a curious. <laughs> I mean, well, look, going into this show, uh, David Jenkins said to me, you know, a lot of our storylines are a little bit Looney Tunes. It's a little bit funny, <laughs> you know, like we're going to say it's cursed, but then, oh, that shirt's so cute. Maybe he just keeps it because he looked really hot in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, like one of the classic ones was when Blackbeard put all these black leathers and threw them over the ship into the ocean, like oh. deep, deep into the ocean. And then he finds them and appears and gets dressed in them and appears out of the ocean wearing them. And I was like, how is that, how is that even possible? Like, what, don't you want me to make an outfit out of seaweed or something? And he's like, like, he's like, Gypsy, Bugs Bunny, Looney Tunes. 
Like he just <laughs> he it. And he finds it. Like he finds it in the ocean. I was like, all right. And his leathers are fine. Just we're like gonna, the boats, gonna... they can magically find navigate in the ocean yeah. and find the yeah. right person they're trying to find. Yeah, well, it's a comedy. We don't think too hard yeah. about things. We just make it cute. Love it. I know. It's amazing. All right. Yeah. So for the question I'm actually supposed to ask. Go on. At I'm going first... to you while you ask the question. Oh, please do. <laughs> at first watch live is curious about the Calypso's birthday party scene. And anything that a non-expert might not notice about the details of the costumes in there? Oh, well, there's so many. Everybody's there on the ship. I know. Um, Fancy, too. I mean, Ned Lowe was a really wonderful costume. And I've spoken a lot about, uh, you know, Wee John's drag and Izzy's beautiful look. And uh, But I think someone like Ned Lowe uh, was a really beautiful costume. We... uh, we made just a pure 18th century uh, cut for Bronson Pinchot and it was based on Paganini the violinist and I just thought look we'll just go straight up 18th century I know so I was again I was like pumping Paganini in the background and going oh it's so evil and stringy and metally and so we made this full 18th century outfit but then Again, we did the calico on the toile. And then before we sewed the whole thing, we painted all the fabric silver and chrome. So it had that metally feel. So normally an 18th century outfit like that would have been, you know, beautiful velvet or some sort of luscious, but we made it this metally silver chrome to kind of punkify it up a bit. And uh, and then things like his little buttons were these... Um, beautiful little like metal coils that are like the end of a violin you know when the violin strings go up and they tighten I wanted all his little buttons to look like that and for him to feel really evil and he and I think that was a costume that that kind of disappeared a little bit into the into the chaos that ensued at the party but uh he was definitely one of my favorites I loved his look oh and I gave him like silver cowboy spurs which were just not even invented in the 18th century, but it just felt right. <laughs> and like, I love that you bring up uh, uh, Paganini because, like, it, that's he like embodies him, like with like the evilness and like, yeah. especially with like his vi- his fixation on like uh, the um, the orchestra of pain or whatever. Yeah. Uh, that it yeah. in there. The symphony of pain. That's um, it. Like That's it was storyline. It was just like just you saying that and making that comment about the inspo for him. Like it, yeah. it just puts every like puzzle piece into place because like it yeah. just adds like, more of an extra depth to it. Yeah, like, it's just they, genius. They called um Paganini <laughs> the devil's violinist. Like whenever he plays, yeah. surely the devil was playing. And I was like, oh, he's such a good bad character. I always like the bad characters. They're the funnest of design. Just. <laughs> So that's one in um, that's one in Calypso's party that I really love making. Everything about Calypso's party was fantastic. All the so many fun costumes for all the people that were at the party or crashed the party. Yeah, that's right. Uh, our next question comes from Pat, Pirate Girl. Uh, how did you communicate the character's growth slash transitions through your medium? Was there anything you were particularly proud of that perhaps didn't make it on screen? That's, that's, that's a lot. That's a good question. That's a lot for me to think about. Uh, I'm trying to think of other things that didn't make it to screen, but I feel like almost everything did. It was something like the Wee John socks, you know, that were there, but you didn't see them. Uh, can't think of what that might be. And then as far as like transitions goes, I really loved how how we split our crew. Well, at the end of season one, when the crew is automatically split up and half go with Blackbeard and half are stranded on an island, I love that we cut to like three months later and they'd still been living under a bridge, but then I got to really like Blackbeardify the entire uh, revenge crew and you know really mad max them up basic because blackbeard's whole outfit is very much inspired by mad max and so you know we had to make them black and 
and nasty and made out of all these found objects. But that's a that was a really big jump for someone like Jim and Frenchie and the ones who were in like pretty pretty simple, beautiful pirate costumes to begin with. And then I went really far. So that jump was my favourite transition. And then it was slowly like taking them out of Blackbeard but keeping the rule that pirates don't have a wardrobe. They they steal their wardrobe. So uh, they more like they lost pieces and gained pieces. So they never really uh, transitioned all that much. It was a little bit more believable. So someone like uh, Jim you know, had these fantastic boots that we made that were like buckles all the way up to the kneecaps and these brilliant pants that were like based on a, a Pete Byrne pant. I don't know if you know Pete Byrne. Look if you don't. Brilliant. He loved Vivian Westwood. Talk about he was a style icon. So I did those paper bag pants and the braces, the suspenders. But I wanted to keep that look because it looked so cool. Uh, but then just started to incorporate a little bit more of Jim into that. At one point, we were going to bring back like that beautiful vest from season one, but but by then, I think Vico had really like taken to this new evolution of what Jim was. So yeah, they were my favorite sort of character transitions. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's really that's really poignant about like the time jump too, like. And how that was very abrupt, like their wardrobe. And I like, I like the realism, like you said, of like pirates can't just they don't just go to stores and buy clothes. Like they're thieving. They yeah, stole. That's yeah. a good. They're a good pair of boots on that dead pirate. I might take those. Yeah, exactly. and and I think that's what makes it more like serendipitous and like ironic. The fact that like Steed finally gets a chance to have like more of like a pirate uh, aspect when he stumbles upon the cursed jacket, and yeah. the crew doesn't let him keep it because it's cursed. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh-huh. like, that just kind of added, like, a little undertone of, like, comedic relief yeah. for the, ir- like, the ironic aspect because it's like, yeah, pirates can steal whatever. But yeah. if your crew thinks it's cursed, you're shit out of luck. <laughs> shit out of luck. Uh, that came with Reese as well. Like, he came into my fitting room and I said, you know, you've lost everything. Like, you've been stranded on an island for three months and living under a bridge and you have nothing anymore. So, like, whatever you find now is what becomes – your new persona and Reese was like oh I don't even get to keep any rings and I was like no <laughs> you get nothing and he goes what about like one earring I'm like no nah, not yet and he's like but what about like a little bit of lace from his coats and I'm like all gone like it's burnt them all and I just had to keep t- it was like a little boy like oh I can't have that I was like no <laughs> he's lost everything. He just he was so sad that he'd lost all that opulence of season one and that he was just down to like just a shitty pair of shirt and pants. And I even went so far as, to, you know, that little like made a D scarf he has. That was yeah. just um, a bit of the couch lining from the ship just ripped <laughs> off and it still had a bit of the tassel. So it was just like really crappy fit of fabric. And we just sort of tied it to make him look like he had some sort of opulence. But in actual fact, it was just from a crappy old couch. <laughs> See, the game plan he should have went with is making the argument of, but Taika got his leather suit back. Why can't I keep an earring? I know. And I was like, <laughs> take it up with the director. I, this is not my fault. <laughs> but one ring, Gypsy, I was like, all right, yeah, later on, let's still use some rings. I'll make you an earring. <laughs> all right. um, That's adorable. Yeah. That's so cute. The best. Um, our next question also involves uh, Mersteed. So, Jason underscore, I'm going to mispronounce Bergeron. this. Bergeron, Bergeron. thank you. Um, they asked, I was curious how long it took to create Mr. S- uh, Mersteed's costume and, and how many people or departments were required to make that happen? Amazingly, it was one incredible woman called Haley Egan, who is a dear old friend of mine in Australia. And she's an incredible props maker. I've worked on many films with her. And she's all, as long as I've known her, she's had an obsession with mermaids and sea creatures and octopus. And she's often sculpting things like this jewelry or it, So I just knew. So when I read that there was a merman in the script and they were talking, they were having the conversation about should it be VFX? Should it be practical? And I was just like, I've got a girl. I have a girl who makes mermaids. Let me do this. And they were like, <laughs> okay, let, let her do this. So 
we so I called up Haley and of course she was just like over the moon. She was like, This is my dream to make this happen. And uh then we started. So she probably had about four weeks. She did it all from Australia with a couple of assistants helping her. Mainly they were like pouring glitter into every scale and uh helping her cast it and and airbrush it and have it come together. So she headed up the tail and we had four in the end. We had a, a stunt re- oh we had a rehearsal one uh and then a stunt and then a two hero one. So it was four tails in the end. And one of my favorite things that happened was they were huge, right? So she said, I'm gonna hand carry them on a plane from Sydney to Auckland. And she got she got two suitcases and sliced the middles out of both of them and joined them and then like gaffed. So she built like a triple size uh suitcase. And then when she got to the Auckland airport and New Zealanders have the funniest sense of humor, the guy says you know, are you importing any meat or fish into the country? And she's like, yeah, full fish. <laughs> Got a whole mermaid in my suitcase. You want to check? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, what is it? And she's like, had, she just came for the weekend to drop it off and like stay and make sure it was all okay. Oh so she probably just had hand carry with her clothes and four mermaid tails in this like giant handmade suitcase. It was brilliant. That is so wild. It's brilliant. Yeah. That's so then, amazing. I want to see the suitcase. Right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's somewhere. It's somewhere. And yeah, so then but when she got to the Auckland then we fitted Reese properly. We'd already done like a pre fitting with a with in Lycra and I'd posted that to her. So she built on on that knowing his size. So then we got it on him and then that was it. We had like two days to shoot. We had like a day to practice and for them to do all their breathing techniques and figure out how deep they could go. And then we had to work out the buoyancy of the of of the tail itself because it was really really heavy. So yeah. you had to make sure that he could still float with the weight. So we did lots of those sort of buoyancy tests, and with the stunt department, and then we shot it, and it was magic, actual magic. I cried. It really was. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, was so, so good. Yeah, yeah. So that was uh, yeah between me and Haley and her. Her assistance, we we did that. Yeah, I, I think my favorite fun fact about the whole Mersteed is uh because I just, I saw an article uh talking about it and I just think it's hilarious that it purely became a thing because Jenkins Jenkins was like, I want to see what you'd look like as a mermaid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he was beautiful. And he was. <laughs> he was. And knowing that Reese, you know, has like little gingery hair and sort of like gingery chest hair and and gingery, you know, skin tone and everything, I was like, well, he has to be a goldfish because it, one, it's just such a sweet little kind of pathetic fish. Yeah. Uh, and it just matched all of it, his persona. And and uh, I and then I after I decided that he should be a goldfish, <laughs> I found. <laughs> I found uh, a little like Chinese cultural thing that said, you know, goldfish mean a good luck and and mm-hmm. love. They tied up all these really beautiful positive imagery. So I was like, well, yeah, of course he has to be a goldfish. Yeah, that's just yeah. lovely. Yeah. <laughs> and Reese was just like, he's just said he's always wanted to become a mermaid. So it was just his dreams come true as well. We were lucky. So many dreams came true with this I know. aspect of the show. I'm so glad they didn't VFX it because yeah, thank you all. Yeah, it you was were. so good. You know, and it's a little bit hokey as well, which I kind of like. Oh yeah. You know, you yeah, came out of left field. <laughs> yeah, you just go. Well, of course I believe it. It's beautiful. We did a reaction video to it, and Theora knew it was coming, and yeah. Zoe and I were talking, and she's like, "Shh, just watch." <laughs> like, what the hell? You cannot stop laughing. laughing. It was so <laughs> goddamn hilarious. I know, but then you're laughing and crying at the same time because it's such a beautiful scene. So you're just like, yeah. "This is ridiculous," but I, my heart hurts. <laughs> yes. Exactly. It's like exactly. I want to. It's like I want to focus on like the pain and like agony that's currently experiencing, but like. God yeah. damn that mermaid tail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when you see outtakes of Reese, he'd like wink at the camera and do like <laughs> like flirty fish things. And you go, Oh, what are we doing? What show are we making? <laughs> yeah, I had saw um a behind the scenes of uh of uh Reese making kissy like a little 
to oh, Taika. Yeah. And I was like, I love it. I love this man. <laughs> They're beautiful, beautiful friendship. Speaking of emotions, mm. at Ramsey underscore B underscore OFMD uh-huh. wants to know what it was like seeing Reese in the full tail re- uh, regalia for the first time and seeing this all come together and underwater. I, I think uh, Samba got a really good video, very embarrassing video of me because I was like on the side of the pool, just like clutching my heart and just being like, I was so proud and I felt, and I, I don't have any children, but I felt like a proud mother of a merman. And I was like, <laughs> I've never been more proud that he like, oh, look, he like, he went so deep and he swam so well and he acted underwater and he looked so beautiful. And I just, I just felt like a proud mother. <laughs> proud Would mother you- of, a, of a mermaid. That is yeah. such a wonderful quote. I yeah. love it so much. Yeah, I really was. And, and, and just, you know, when you see it all come to, together, like that's most of my job is we spend weeks making and, and refining and fitting and making sure that just that very quick moment on screen is as beautiful as it can be. And so just when that alchemy happens and, you know, you're there and then the hair and makeup team have done a beautiful job and they've covered him in glitter and, you know, then the props team have given him a, uh, scepter and you know, the stunt team have worked so hard at making sure that they can breathe and relax deep underwater and then the lighting guys come in and put these shafts of light that hit the glitter on the fins and you know it's this like a magical alchemy of when it all comes together and then they just go action and you go oh we all did that we all came together and made that moment in film so it's very rare when things like that come together so beautifully. I saw the behind the scenes video you posted on Instagram about it. And it just blows my mind how they're able to film underwater and just having the huge tanks. I'm impressed. That has to be a lot of work. And you know, there's only a few of those tanks around the world. So New Zealand has one, Gold Coast has one, Atlanta has one, Mexico had one for a little while there. And so there's all those films, they like the Pirates of the Caribbean, Meg, uh, you name it, like they all go to the same tanks and film in there. And it's amazing, you know, what, what can be, what magic can be made. You said, was it Haley who Haley. did the tail? Haley. Yeah. Um, it, did she make tales for other shows and stuff? Or is this her first time making it for the... I think this was the first time she'd made one for a movie. I know she'd done personal ones for her and her daughter for swimming and and whatnot. But she's just she's sculpted sort of sea creaturey things most of her career. So I, she does this like incredible octopus chandelier that she'd sculpted that all lights up and yeah, like she's just very very clever. I've worked with her many times, and every time I'm just blown away by what she's able to create we worked on uh, a mcdonald's commercial recently which was (laughs) weird and funny and uh, i wanted to make like a pair of balenciaga crocs that were uh, a mccrispy chicken burger and so i was like you know i was like you know like we'll just slice the croc in half and then we'll have like a chicken patty and some lettuce and some mayo and some mustard seeds and she's like yeah yeah got it goes away, comes back with all these photos. I'm like, you're a genius. <laughs> well, while I probably won't be able to afford it, if she does have an Etsy shop, I would love to peruse. <laughs> yeah. I think she sells her jewelry online. Uh, HaleyEganDesign.com from memory. I was just curious because there was a kid show that filmed in Australia called yeah. H2O that used yeah. a lot of mermaid tales. So it did, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was one of the, they were one of the first teams I thought of. I was like, oh, who made those? Because they were mm-hmm. really beautiful, I thought. I thought they yeah. were beautiful on camera. <laughs> was, but I was working on um, Narnia up in the Gold Coast when they were shooting H2O. And I remember just kind of going to lunch one day and walking in the back lot. And some guy was just pulling a trolley with like four tails from H2O just stacked on each other. And he's just like, you know doing his job (laughs) and I was just like what (laughs) am I (laughs) I'm I'm amazed at how 
<laughs> realistic these two i mean not that i know what it would look like in real life but like they look so good yeah yeah but so like, they look they, so heavy <laughs> yeah so heavy because silicon is really the only thing that holds up underwater and in chlorine because those pools have to be like heavily chlorinated yeah. and chlorine kills everything kills all fabric and yeah. it's like bleach so silicon yeah. has to so you have to find a way to like make it light enough but sort of all out of silicon latex and wetsuit materials and they're all really dense and really yeah. heavy so yeah we knew we didn't have long yeah we had like a we had these baths on the side as well that were like just big old tubs from you know the hardware store and they all had their different type of uh, cleaning product in it that would clean the latex and the silicon and the uh lycra between shots so that we could like keep the longevity of it so we'd like dunk them like you know like like old photographs and they all have their like solution of their oh, train yeah, yeah, yeah. it was like that but with a fish tail and we <laughs> when we get to the end and like hang it up and we'd be ready for the next take that is hilarious oh my god and we had to build a ramp the pool as well because to uh, roll them in yeah, to roll him in. So I, uh, I basically, I was like, oh, well, how am I going to get him around once he's like in it? And I thought it back to this like Bette Midler performance where she played a mermaid in a wheelchair. And I was like, oh, we're just going to go rent a wheelchair. And so we found, we were able to rent a wheelchair from like the local chemist or hospital, oh. I don't know. And, we, and then I said, okay, well, he still has to get up into the pool, which is like two metres. So we talked about like a little sling or do we carry him? And um, I spoke to the construction department and they just built him a wheelchair mermaid ramp so we could just wheel him up and then kind of push him in. <laughs> that is so great. There you go. There you go. Off you go. Yeah, I was wondering I was how saying, he was going to walk in that. I was like, there's no way. No. No. <laughs> you can stand because the, the, the monofin, they call it, you can stand up straight in it. But then once you're swimming, it like flows with you, but you can stand. So he stood up while we did all the final glitter and makeup and everything. And then he just sat back down and we wheeled him in. I think Samba has footage of that as well. Oh, Amazing. lovely. All right. Our next question pivots. Sadly, we're pivoting away from Merced okay. um, into Spanish Jackie territory. Ooh, so yeah. S, S in the wind, 43220 wants Ooh. to know. Um, about the origin of Spanish Jackie's wooden hand. Oh, you know what? I don't know that question. Somebody, oh. yeah. Uh, I would imagine that she'd lost it in a fight because she's a very violent woman who loves chopping off noses and, she does. you know, owns a pirate bar. So there's probably had been some encounter. Uh, but back in those days, like any sort of amputees, or anybody missing any limbs uh, would have been sculpted out of a wood because it was sort of like pre-metal, you know, pre-industrial mm -hmm. revolution. So if you were missing a limb, they usually uh, had it sculpted out of wood. So I would imagine that's probably the storyline. And I like that she sort of like decorated it with rings and it had nails mm -hmm. <laughs> and it perfectly yeah. held like a cigar. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I thought it was a very nice, like, little detail because it's, like, it's definitely, like, a blink and you'll miss it type of detail because, like, she wears it so well. Yeah. Like, it just looks like a regular hand, not a wooden hand. So it's such yeah. a nice, like, attention to detail type of thing. Yeah. It's funny because, it's, again, it's that Looney Tunes thing. Like, I never asked. I didn't ask any questions. I was like, oh, she's got a wooden hand. And then I would just decorate it. I put, like, little lace frills and, and just de decorate this beautiful hand. <laughs> but I never asked where it came from. I'm sorry, I don't have the answer. Oh no, it's okay. I just, I also just love that it's not just a normal wooden hand. It has all those attention to detail. It has personality, like yeah. you're saying, which is a, a life of its own. And, like, and Leslie would like act with it, you know, like everything became like this, and it like I demand it. do things. Yeah, I loved it. It was very, very funny. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. All right. So our next question kind of ties into Reese's. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to call it a temper tantrum, but like a plea for for extra add-ons. Um, so <laughs> yeah, this question comes from uh, Gina Dora, and she uh, she or they want to know um, more about the teal robe. 
and the reason why I brought up uh, yeah. you and Reese's conversation, I it, it's so it's kind of like, is this like a compromise? Like, because it, it looks so comfortable. Um, oh, yeah, so like, I, I want to know, because I know like Reese would have loved it. Um, and I know Ed wore it because he looked very comfortable in it. So it was like that, like a compromise to like give like the crew like a little bit extra since like Ed had lost like his leather, like attire prior, like what's the context behind it? Uh, not that deep, but it, uh, it, uh, we would imagine that like he'd burnt the Blackbeard once he'd taken over the revenge had sort of set all of Steed's clothes on fire in, in a heartbroken, you know, thrown him overboard, like get rid of anything that, belongs to him he doesn't want to see it but the thinking behind it was that maybe he just kept one little thing that like just <laughs> a little memory of steve oh. and so you know and the, and the robe in season one was so beloved and i knew that we had this this scene with them in bed having breakfast and so i said oh you know what if the what if the piece that he's kept is just another robe that we'd never seen of steeds and, you know, something like those robes fit anybody. So kind of anyone can put it on and it looks beautiful. Uh, so then we started building what would be the next robe. And that's actually, that's one of the ones that didn't get seen as much. And I have had a lot of questions about it, like what's the lining like and and all of that business. But we made it so quickly and it was on screen so quickly that uh, I don't really have any imagery, sadly, but it was this beautiful velvet silk velvet and it was in that tealy color that we love that reminds us of steed from season one and then we dip dyed we ombre dyed the whole bottom in this sort of dark dark colorway and all the inside was lined in in a chinese silk as like a little nod to zheng but not really it was just love it. pretty so it was this like pale purple chinese silk and then i had all these um you know because we were always scouring markets and thrift stores and Etsy for just kind of strange metal-y things that they would have found at sea. And I'd found these like curtain tassels that were bullion, which is like a metal, and they were just these balls with tassels. And I, we never had any costumes to put them on. And I always had them hanging in my office because I loved them. And I was like, oh, let's hang them on the robe. So we had the off the sleeve. They had these pretty little metal tassels. And, yeah, and then he got – he was just – you know, then Tyker wore it, and I think Tyker kept that robe. <laughs> I think he He's loved very it. So much. Like, can we take this one home, and I was like, "Yes, yes, we can." <laughs> That's cute. You That's actually so cute. ended up answering the follow-up question for from Gina Dor, which was the the lining was the lining that died. What color is it? Because they yeah. wanted to know for cosplay. I know, I know. I wish I had some good photos of it. Sometimes we're just rushing so much to get things done and on screen that I like. I remember the fitting photo I have is just the plain teal velvet. And so there was no detail, no lining, no nothing. It was just like, here's the shape. Does that fit you? Yep, good, go. Out. Dye it. Da, da, da. Put it on screen. Put it, shoot it, put it in a box, gone. <laughs> like it was so just very fast. fast. And so, um, yeah, I don't have many reference pictures sadly but yeah the lining it's like that Chinese silk that has little flowers and it starts off as this kind of lilac and then it dip dyed into the ends like ombre into a sort of a darker purple which was Blackbeard's color so I mm -hmm. wanted like a touch of steed and a touch of Blackbeard in there so it was really the teals and the purples joined together with these kind of rusted metal bullion tassels oh that is adorable yes. <laughs> thank you so we kind of talked about this a bit, but I'm going to ask again, just in case your answer might be different. Mm. At Dean Bird on AO3, what costu which costumes are you proudest of? Any fun stories from putting them together? I mean, I'm proud of them all. I just told you I was a proud mother of a merman. Like anything that, <laughs> anything that came out of the workshop and then was on screen, I was just like, oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> So that's a really hard one to answer. That is really like choosing your favorite child. I, I don't know if I can. <laughs> they're just, they're all fabulous. Yeah, seriously. they all had their own story and they all had their own persona and then the actors brought them to life and I, everything. It was everything. 
Okay, all right. There's one favorite I had, which was, <laughs> <laughs> which was this. Back, my arm. <laughs> I had this vision. Oh, I well, that's right. I was listening to this podcast on the way to work every day, called the Pirate History Podcast. It's fantastic, and he was talking about how so many rats were at the bottom of a ship and the rats would eat all the food that the pirates had so then they had to steal more food and you know rats were always just like a problem at sea because they could live in the water and all that sort of thing so i one day just for one of the pirates that comes into the bar uh, i was like you know what we need to make we need to make a jacket of rats and so instead like and we obviously we use all fake fur in the show to be um, good to the world and good to animals and so we built little fake fur rats. Uh, this wonderful girl on my team, Melissa, she made tiny little tails and tiny little arms and legs and little ears. And then we sewed like hundreds of them together into a vest. And then we took it to the breakdown department who made it just look all crusty and like just dead rats. And there's just this beautiful rat vest in the show. And that's oh, that piece. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Love sort of everything that. about that <laughs> <laughs> and I was I couldn't think of what like person to put it on but when it all came together I was very proud of, of the little rat vest I would yeah, be too me, yeah as you should be I wore I, it I gotta go find the rat vest yeah I, I, would walk, I would walk around the office wearing it and everyone would be like oh my god she's wearing it <laughs> <laughs> just being historically accurate for our show <laughs> <Right>? like... <laughs> crazy designer <laughs> But I think your first answer is very fair because you should be proud of every single costume that was Thank created you. because they all have a personality. They're all amazing. Yeah. I wanted to wear all of them. Seriously. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Same. Okay. I love it. Uh, I'm going to butcher this next person's name. So I apologize. I'm trying. Oh. So do you want at, me to do it for you? At Freeburg Nadja. Was that close? I, I, okay, so my take was Freiburg, Nadia. Okay. So we have two different takes. Go ahead. Hopefully one's right. Okay, Nadia, what's your question? (laughs) They say, all my love to the makeup and costume designers. What a look. Loved every single detail. No, (laughs) it's sweet. So first love. Now question. Zhang's costume, uh, uh, how historically accurate was it? Oh, she was like one of the very close to close to period costumes that we did. I didn't really like put a punk uh, take on her at all. Uh, we, I looked at a lot of um, museum pieces of clothing. So there's a whole lot of like amazing museum websites like the VNA and and Natural History Museum. And they'll quite often photograph pieces of clothing flat and you just kind of get the back and the front. And I had a lot of photographic reference as well, which was a little bit later because obviously cameras were not involved and I looked at a lot of art from that period as well and just followed the lines because I wanted to get it accurate for you know the purposes of just being um culturally representing it properly and I am not Chinese as you may have noticed so I wanted to make sure that I did it right and good so I really looked into what was worn in that period through the form of art and museums and so uh we then just cut pieces and 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 made our own version of what we thought that might be from the picture reference so she was very much uh, you know pattern wise and and detail wise accurate to that period and then the fabrics obviously had to be modern because I was buying them from a modern fabric store but we tried to make sure that we got a lot of like Chinese silks and made sure that it was the correct Chinese print and and we made all the they call them little frogs you know the knots so we made sure mm-hmm. that all we hand made all of those that they looked um correct actually back to those Zheng uniforms as well Melissa who made all the little rat tails she also made thousands of those tiny little frog knots you see like three on every zheng uniform oh, yeah. so three times 200 she handmade all of those that's <laughs> impressive dedication impressive. So impressive impressive yeah so zheng was very much the, actually the one little punk thing that i did give her though was her uh leather cuffs and mm. oh, again yeah. they were sort of like based on 
Chinese armor a little bit, but then I added these kind of the silhouette of a little skull and then two little gold crossbars. So they That's were so like three, three hidden little skull and crossbones as her little pirate nod. But yeah, otherwise she was very historically accurate. That character is one of my I favorites love, in general. I love Kang. <laughs> She's so good. Yeah, we, we were absolutely just praising the character when we were doing yeah. uh, our reaction episode for it. Like, just very well written and like the historical accuracy. Like, it's just overall, it's such a good character. Oh, yeah. She's so badass. And I, yeah, just love that character. And I loved Auntie as well, who was her side. I love oh Auntie. my God. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Auntie was <laughs> just like, everything i loved her so much and with auntie we had originally cast uh or it had been scripted that she was a chinese uh grandma but then once we met annapella uh, and in the reading we we're just like oh my god she's so fabulous then i sort of had to incorporate less chinese and more sort of maori culture and almost again like that pirate thinking of like oh she stole that jacket and that vest and she stole those pants and this necklace is all the things she's collected along the silk road and and so yeah so we weren't being we were just making our own version of other pieces she'd collected from from her journey on Jing ships through the silk road but still being um you know kind and aware to her maori culture very very lovely um <laughs> not too much so this kind of plays off of dean's question a little bit um but it's it's its own question in and of itself. It's just a similar theme. Um, this is from Ghost in the Stacks. Uh, what costume were you most excited to see put into action and or what was the most difficult one to create? Ooh. Actually, the English army was really difficult. Really? Uh, yes, because we had to, they were all period correct. And we had some of the we had some of the uniforms from season one, but they were not enough because David Jenkins had this vision of you know, like the whole English army taking over the Republic of Pirates. And mm -hmm. so again, that was like three or 400 costumes, much like the ring, but we, uh, like I tried to, you know, and their colors were navy and cream and gold, and we couldn't find enough fabric around the world. And like the all the wool we had to import from England because New Zealand didn't have enough navy wool <laughs> to cover our army oh, and we didn't we had to like source gold braid from everywhere around the world to like just make sure we had enough meterage to cover like the tricorns and all down the thing and who had like to sort of piece that together was huge and a mammoth effort of my team and they were all like period correct pants and vests and shirts and coats as well and so and that yeah that was just a mammoth effort but then when we saw it all come together on screen and you see them all like arrive and take over the republic of pirates you you it was like epic and iconic and then to have our cast and you know our cast of pirates steal their uniforms and wear them that then became like its own storyline and I gave them all their own little characters of like who what they stole and how they styled it on themselves which was really really fun so that was probably like had it was the hardest work and had such a huge reward seeing it all come together with knowing the backstory behind it that kind of raises the question if you don't know the answer to this that is totally fine yeah. what was y'all's costume budget for like keeping like every like all of this in mind like i would assume like it would have to be like at least like a pretty penny to be able to like reach out and source these products and like make sure it's still ethical and it just yeah. seems like a lot going into the costume designing part, uh, aspect of it yeah if you're allowed yeah. to answer that yeah if you're I allowed <laughs> I don't know the figure off the top of my head but i do know that uh that budgets on film are never as much as you need and you know, I've worked on really small horror films up to like huge James Cameron avatar type budgets. And there's always, you, you just find where you lie in that, in that scale and you make it work. And a lot of the time it's not really about like the materials per se. It's all of our budget goes into labor and the craftsmanship. So 
that is where all my budget goes is into the leather makers and the dyers and the seamstresses and the runners and the coordinators and and that team is the thing that uh that makes it work so when you when I talk about things like oh we had to go to England to get wool in the scheme of things that wasn't that expensive it was more expensive for the seamstresses to sit there and sew 400 coats because their time is more uh is more laborious and expensive because of Mm -hmm. how long it takes to make it so beautiful so yeah did that answer (laughs) yes it definitely did thank you for that (laughs) But I don't know the number. I'm also like quite dyslexic and not very good with numbers. So <laughs> no, that's totally fine. Right. <laughs> that's that is fair. <laughs> so our last question comes from at here briefly one. What is the process for determining or and creating the aesthetic for background actors? From season one to season two, the styles of people in the Republic of Pirates seem to modernize and be more leather forward. So what went into that newer look? (laughs) Leather forward is such a good term. I want to use that all the time. (laughs) They also say thank you for everything. You are welcome. Uh, Again, it came back to that uh, brief from David Jenkins with the the cast where he just said it's the streets of New York. So, of course, I just went straight to punk because 80s New York, that was a huge... It was a huge part of it. And also it was that punk scene that like informed hip hop and and that became like that melded into that in the later 80s. So it just was hard, just punk. And I had a whole team who were just working on the extras. So uh, I think it was a team of five or six team members who would find pieces and it, like, it might be from the thrift store, it might be from we made sourced it made you know just like an amalgamation of a million pieces and we had it all lined up in like vests pants coats jewelry gloves petticoats crinolines corsets they just went on and on and on so we built like a library per se of all of these costumes and then almost every single one of those pieces went through the art finishing department who break it all down and rip it and burn it and add vomit and (laughs) and then we we just had this pirate library, basically. And one of the things that David also was really adamant about was that, you know, it had an iconic look and didn't look like Pirates of the Caribbean or we didn't want it to look like piratey per se. So we sort of invented a lot of characters that looked like they could have been in a band or they could have been, you know, an artist of that period and and still incorporate 18th century silhouettes. But just really leaned in on, um, yeah, the, the New York streets of the 80s. And that's what gave it that beautiful look. Very nice. Leather, leather forward. That's leather forward. <laughs> <laughs> Never going to forget that. <laughs> well, that's all the questions we and the audience have for you today. Oh, uh, we could great. probably talk to you forever. You're so oh, amazing. Really and so is your Seriously. work. Oh, thank you, um, I believe you worked on Wheel of Time, which we're going to cover at some point. I did, yeah. I was That's the, one uh, of Theora's favorite. Oh yeah, really? It's a great show. Oh, oh my god! And this, and again, the outfits just. That's Iconic. for another time. If you're game to talk about it, because sure, yeah. Wow, <laughs> those outfits. Yeah, they were good fun. I was I was actually reminiscing the other day about the Tinkers. They were one of our favorite oh things. Oh my god! Yes, together. all the colors. Oh, yes. it was beautiful. Like we had this whole like oh. Peruvian hot pinks, and it was delightful. Yeah, yeah. the Tinkers yeah, that was were super really... fun from a costume perspective. Yeah, that was a really special job. Yeah. And also, like on the pages, like the Robert Jordan books, like he just explains it all, and you go, "Oh my god, yeah. that's beautiful!" Like, how do we make that happen? And how do we exactly. come up with those eye sky colors and you know, all that. The Amberlynn's dress and like all that stuff. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're a fan. And uh, they were great questions. So thank you to everybody who who wrote in and um, and asked questions. It means so much. And I love seeing all the cosplay costumes. It just warms my heart. <laughs> also, I need to just confirm this for myself, but didn't you also work on the Chronicles of Narnia? I did, yeah. The first one and yeah, okay. the third one. So Lime Witch in the Wardrobe. And then the Dawn Treader years later. Yeah. Yeah. I started out there's as a costume. There's more than one? Treader. Yeah, there's more than one. I think it's like there's a trilogy. Three. Yeah. There was going to be like four or yeah. five. 
And I heard yeah. a rumor that I think Greta Gerwig is is like yeah, is going to take movie. over Prince Caspian. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that yeah, first one was like one of my first jobs, and I was a costume illustrator. Wow. Uh, so I worked under the costume designer and just drew and painted all day long, and it was just well, it paid off. Those it, costumes were gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, really good. Yeah, I'm very, very lucky to work on lots of fantasy projects, which is one of my favorites. That's awesome. Uh, again, we obviously we could talk to you all day, but we are yeah so happy that you joined us today. Thank you again for taking the time to talk oh, with us. Wow. We really appreciate and love getting to know you and your work better. And to you to and every- everybody, everybody at the Big Gay Energy Podcast, thank you for inviting me. It was very special. Oh, to everyone at home listening, make sure to check out Our Flag Means Death streaming on Max. And until next time, hydrate for lesbian Jesus. And gay it up all over the place. Bye. Bye. Cheers, queers. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we've been Big Gay Energy. If you like this episode, check out all our other episodes right here on YouTube. Please like, leave a comment below, and subscribe for more amazing super gay content.